Ronald's bought me this pasture towel, and so hopefully I'll be using this today. Uh, just wiping the sweat. <laughs> if you remember the sign, spin it around means run around the church, and jump up and down, and this means just fall out. Okay, so just, if we need to practice that, we can. Uh, we'll give it a shot. Amen. You know, I, I really don't even want to have to do that. I think we should just we just worship the Lord as as God moves. Amen. Amen. Move, and I, I definitely feel him already in this place, and I know that God is going to continue to do great things. Now, uh, let me say before I get started, I always do a disclaimer that uh, it, is, it is enjoyable for me to teach these lessons on marriage and family because I am an expert husband and an expert father. I am the best. I know everything about everything. There is nothing I don't know. I'm the wisest ever. Sister Johnson's giving me a look. Don't give me that look. Okay. The truth of the matter is, I am none of those. I am not an expert father. I'm not an expert husband. I am one of those that makes mistakes and learns along the way. That's how we do it, Brother Robert. So, he has twins plus one. So, I can't complain around him. I can't say anything. He's been there, done that. But, uh... If you will allow me today, I just want to uh, to give you something that I believe from my heart is very necessary. I will tell you that there are going to be some sobering things that I want to talk about today. But it's important. Uh, if you are someone that does not have any children, uh, you still have a job. You're a part of the church. And your job is to help us uh, raise our, our children in the fear and the admonition of the Lord. That's extremely important. If you have children that are small or teenagers... These are things that you can put in and incorporate with, with what we're doing. If you are an elder here today, you have children or grandchildren, uh, we're going to be leaning on you, amen, for the things that, uh, Sister Shirley, good to see you again today, amen, but the wisdom that you can have, see, is you help us youngsters raise our youngsters. So if you have your leaflet or your Bibles, turn with me to Exodus chapter 1 and verse number 22, amen, again, as you turn there, I... Uh, Oh, brother Nate uh, Homer, that you know, I wanted him here to, to be able to witness my ministry uh, today. To uh, normally we let our speakers come later, and I really want him to get, you know to hear me today. And uh, of course, at the community meeting we were just at together, all we did is get up there and tell jokes. He said he, he experienced enough of my ministry, so <laughs> he's got it all covered. But um, yeah, so I'm going to try my best to to put this. Uh, to you in a way today that that you're going to learn some things, and I believe that that if you let the Lord speak to you, I believe that it will it will talk to you today. Because how many love how many love your children? I mean, just how many love each other's children as a church? We love our children, and I want them to be protected. And so the lesson today is on parents as protectors and providers. Two vitally important um, two vitally important roles that parents. Uh, take on. Exodus chapter 1 beginning with verse number 22. And Pharaoh charged all his people saying every son that is born ye shall cast into the river and every daughter ye shall save alive. Exodus 2 1 through 10. And there went a man of the house of Levi and took to wife a daughter of Levi. The woman conceived and bare a son. And when she saw him, that he was a goodly child she hid him three months. And when she could not longer hide him she took him uh, took for him an ark of bulrushes and dotted it with slime and with pitch and put it uh, the child therein and she laid it in the flags by the river's bank. And his sister stood afar off to wit what would be done to him. And the daughter of Pharaoh came down to wash herself at the river and her maidens walked along by the riverside. When she saw the ark among the flags, she sent her maid to fetch it. Now, look at verse 6. When she had opened it, she saw the child, and behold, the babe wept. And she had compassion. Everybody say compassion. compassion. She had compassion on him. That's something that is really lacking in the world today. Right? Right. Compassion yeah. towards children. And said, this is one of the Hebrews' children. I think that's amazing. She sees one of the Hebrews' children. She's Egyptian, but instead of just sending it on, she herself has compassion on this child. Then said his sister to Pharaoh's daughter, shall I go? And called to thee a nurse of the Hebrew women, that she may nurse the child for thee. Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Go. And the maid went and called the child's mother. And Pharaoh's daughter said unto her, Take this child away and nurse it for me, and I will give thee thy wages. And the woman took the child and nursed it. 
And the child grew, and she brought him into Pharaoh's daughter. And he became her son, and she called his name Moses. And she said, because I drew him out of the water. Brother Wallace, read the focus verse if you would. For me, please. And you fathers, provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Okay, Brother um, Barry, read the focus off for me. God commissioned parents to protect and provide for their children. All right. It is our job as parents to protect and to provide for our children. Who has ever heard the term helicopter parents? Helicopter parents. Have you ever heard of that? What does a helicopter do? It hovers. Okay. So uh, there was a book written back in 1969. Uh, it was between parent and teenager. A wonderful book. And in it, uh, the writer cites a young man who stated this. My mother hovers over me like a helicopter. And so thus, the, uh, the uh, statement was born, uh, or the term was born, helicopter parents. Now, this is to describe parents that, if you will, hover too closely or maybe are overly protective of their children and they do not allow them to mature normally. And uh, I know this for a fact having served on the youth, uh, in the youth department and running camps and things like that uh, in our fellowship uh, in the UPC and in Kentucky District. I'm sure it happens in other districts as well. But summer camps especially have had to learn how to deal with parents that call and check on their precious babies every single day. You know, making sure are they in the right bunk? Uh, are they hanging with the right kids? And there are parents every single day want to know, is everything okay? Is, is, is everything, you know, the way it's supposed to be? And, and whereas their children's welfare is extremely important, there are parents that try to intervene and, and, and do things, you know, that, that may be a little bit over the top. There are even college students, believe it or not, that when they go to college, and their uh, parents begin to miss them, which is almost right away, they call the college and they want to make sure, is the professor's treating my baby right? Anybody know what I'm talking about? I got one of my best friends with a craner in all the world. His son uh, took him up a couple days ago to, to start in that, that horrible Bible college, Indiana Bible College. And today was the, got some graduates here today. And so the, the first day uh, was, uh, today. Today, I guess, was the first service. And so today is the first day that, that Brother Johnny Craner is at church, Brother Wallace, without his son by his side. He is a mess. And we, as his close friends, have been riding him the whole way. Can we send you a crying towel, Johnny? Do you need your mommy, Johnny, to come and call on you while your son's away? Now, I'm doing this now because my kids are with me. Uh, see. I mean, it, but, but you know, it, it's, it's different. When your kids are, are away, um, it, it affects them. And so he's having an extremely difficult day today, and he asked for prayer, to which we replied, no way, he'll say. <laughs> so uh, quite, quite often, uh, this kind of parenting is really the result of good intentions, okay? And let that be understood. But sometimes good intentions can go astray. The intention to protect your children is a good intention. And there are areas of life that you can, not, you can be none too careful. Yep. Amen. Okay? Then there's areas of life that you just need to let your child grow up. Let your child mature. I think I've mentioned it here before. When my kids are 16 years old and they still don't know how to tie their shoes, then they don't know how to button their pants on their own, we have a problem. Right? A big problem. Amen. You have to let them grow up. So while it is very unhealthy to be consumed with protecting our children, um, again, from getting the wrong bunk in camp or oversleeping in college class, that sort of thing, it is altogether appropriate to protect your children from the spiritual wrongness in the world. Amen. There's an awful lot of spiritual wrongness in the world. Our responsibility as parents is to mind the matters of your children. It is our responsibility, our responsibility to shelter them in, in, a, in a good uh, way from the time they're children and up, um, to try to help keep them from spiritually destructive forces and voices that are in 
uh, their lives. In the book of Romans chapter 16 and verse 19, Paul stated that we should be simple concerning evil. We don't need to look at things and, and think, you know what, uh, everything was alright with me growing up in that area, so it's going to be fine for them too. One thing I've learned in the seven long years that I've been a parent, Brother Kevin, is that in seven years, it's not what I thought it was. I can't look at things that I was allowed to do as a child. When I look at them now, it's altogether different. Vastly different. I, I'm telling you, there are. I'm very protective of my children. I mean, I walk in a public place and I'm watching other people to see how they look at my kids. I'm seeing how they watch my children. And if my children are misbehaving, then I need to deal with that. If my children are being good, and other people, you know, they're, they're just, there's some weirdos out there. Yeah. There's some weirdos. I'll never forget, we were on vacation with the Bears one year, and we went to Gatlinburg, and my cousin Chera, she had Luke, and he was a baby, and he could not be settled down for nothing. I know all y'all's kids are perfect, but this kid could not get settled down for anything. He was whining and crying, and we were at that, what's that big restaurant? Old Mill, that one where 5,000 people go and eat, and it's Starch City. We were all eating, and there's like millions of people, what seems like there. And Brother Barry, this, this lady walks over from the back of the restaurant. I see her from the back of the restaurant. She walks over, complete stranger, and she comes over to my cousin and goes, Oh dear, would you like me to take him for you while you eat? Mm. And Chair looked up at her and said, uh, No, thank you. I think I've got my child. <laughs> really? A complete stranger walking up to you? Can I take your child? I know some of you might think, Hey! If you can do something with it, be my guest. We don't have to worry about that because when they see we have twins, they just walk away. Hey, oh, no, no. They leave. So you have to understand that there are some weirdos out there. But you really don't need to be a helicopter parent. You don't need to be the kind of parent that hovers over them. You want to be a parent that is always aware of spiritual traps and dangers. But your responsibility and my responsibility is to do our best to help our children navigate in a very unrighteous world. And teach them how to serve a holy God. And so, you know, we, we can learn a lot by watching the behavior of animals. You really can Absolutely. If you look at the behavior of animals and you watch them, you see how they treat their young, how they're protective over their young. There, was, there have been cases of forest, uh, large forests that have burnt down and they have found you know, baby birds coming out from underneath the, the, the burnt body of their mother because their mother you know, sheltered them when the flames got hot and, and gave her life for them. And a lot can be learned from, from that sort of thing. Um, you know, it's not saying that our children are animals, but, you know, sometimes they are. Sometimes they're monkeys. But, but we can learn. We can learn how to protect our children. And not only do animals protect their young, but they provide for them. It's amazing watching how mamas, you know, they, they shelter and they care for their young. and They bring food, you know, the moms go out and they find the worms and they bring them back to the nest and all that kind of stuff. Their, their whole day revolves around primarily caring and providing for their young. And God has also placed that natural distinctive in every single one of us. To care for and nurture our children. Because the truth of the matter is, children are gifts from God. Amen. Nothing makes my blood boil any more than when people have kids and then treat them like they don't want them. Amen. If you didn't want the kids, you shouldn't have had the kid to begin with. Amen. Oh, that was my mistake. Yeah, I mean, okay, well, you know what? Well, I won't go any further than that, but the truth of the matter is, is that we, if we bring children into this world, it is our responsibility to care for our children. Yeah. Amen. Not someone else's responsibility. It's my responsibility. It is not your responsibility to raise my child. You helped me raise my child in the church, okay? And we'll get into a little bit more of that in just a moment. But when parents raise their children and they're always dishing them off on somebody else, they want somebody else to raise them, somebody else to care for them. Folks, we live in a world that they are degrading the lives of children every single day. And it gets progressively worse. The issues of our day today underscore the importance for every parent, especially godly parents, to learn how to protect and to learn how to provide. we got to do more than just provide food and shelter for our children. 
Because Jesus Christ told us life is a whole lot more than just clothing and food. Amen. Right? right? Life is a whole lot Amen. more than that. Satan does not want our children to be safe. And he's doing everything he can to destroy them. So protecting um, for our children, providing for them, this is, nothing, this is nothing that's easy. It is a very challenging thing. It is a very time-consuming thing. But these responsibilities are very, very important. I believe that a parent, and I'm preaching to the choir here, but a parent needs to give their children full attention and care. It's very difficult when you're doing something and your kid comes up to you. Dad, 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 dad. Mommy, 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 mommy. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Yeah. Mommy, mommy. You're pulling on the What? What? <laughs> I know you'd love to say that you're the parent that says, yes, dear, after the first time they call your name. But you're not. They don't come to you when you're doing nothing. <laughs> They're smarter than that. They come to you when, you're, when you've got one finger in one ear, this one's on the phone, your foot's turning with this, and, and you're just doing a thing, and you're not. We were up here last night working. i got to share this with you. We were up here last night where we stopped by and uh, made sure the bad street was warm and, and so my kids are on the front row. And uh, we let them, you know, sit on the front row and play with their little legs. And they were out there playing. So me and my wife, I, I think I'm in the bad street. It wasn't full then. I was in there cleaning the dirt out. And all of a sudden I hear pop and a light bulb goes out. And there's my two minions standing right here in the middle of the church. <laughs> and they both look at me. They know something's up. I said, boys, what happened? Well, one of them had decided to chuck a Lego <laughs> into that light fixture right there and hit a ball. I said, who did it? Logan said, or Logan. <laughs> they talked about Logan earlier. Connor said, Connor said, that was me, but Bubby's the one that told me to do it. <laughs> so, and so we're not here forever. I had to get out of the baptismal, come over here, you know, get their Legos. I said, I want both of you. The Lord was here last night. Trust me. My children are living today. Set one of them there, set one of them there, and I got up on top of the ladder, and I reached down in that light fixture, pulled the Lego out, and then I gave them a speech how we do not, we do a lot of things in church, but we do not throw Legos in church. So, yeah, they did, that's what our kids do. They, they, and, you know, we're working, we're, and you think that they're taking care of themselves. But children do not take care of themselves. They don't know how to do that. They're gifts from God. Psalms 127 and verse 3. Turn there, if you will. Now, I'm going to read to you how the message puts it, but I just kind of want you to follow along uh, in, in your Bible. In Psalms 127 and verse 3, it gives you just a glimpse of how valuable the children are. To every one of us. Psalms 127 and verse number 3. Again, this is the message. It says... Don't you see that children are God's best gift? The fruit of the womb, His generous legacy. Like a warrior's fistful of arrows are, in the, uh, are the children of a vigorous youth. Oh, how blessed are you parents with your quivers full of children. Your enemies don't stand a chance against you. You'll sweep them right off your doorstep. God is pleased with children. He loves children. I find it amazing that in all of their imperfections, He loves them. Yes. I find it amazing how much He honors children in all of their inconsistencies. When they are disobedient, when they don't mind, when they're getting on your nerves, guess what? God still loves them. Right. What a testimony that is to every one of us. I think, well, I serve a God that when I'm disobedient, He still loves me. Amen. Amen. That whenever I make a mistake, he doesn't, you know, he still loves me. He doesn't want to get rid of me. I'm thankful for that. God had given a great gift to the family, given a great gift to the church. But these great gifts require a lot of attention to, and much effort to fully cultivate and develop and maintain. And so as recipients of the gift of children, if you have children, we've got to... Focus on this gift to the family and put our all into helping to raise them. Children not only require constant care, but they also require the right kind of care. We should raise our children to learn how to love. 
Right. You know one of the greatest blessings in my life is when I'm walking through, and it happened this morning, when I'm walking through my house and for no reason at all that I can, you know, they're not wanting anything, I don't think. But like I'll hear Daddy, and I'll be walking through the hall, I'm on the way to get something to Daddy, and I'll say what? They'll say, I love you. They just say, I love you. Mommy, I love you. And, and I remember today when that happened today, I was thinking how we, from the time they were a small child, we kept saying that when they started talking and having conversations, we would just look at them and for no reason at all, we would say, I'd say, Connor, I love you. Colin, I love you. We did that because we want that always resounding in our home. Right. I want my kids to always know that I love them. Amen. And I want those children to know, those two boys to know, that they can always tell me that they love me. Because there's going to come a day where that might be hard to squeeze out for some of our kids. Right. You know, that might be, there might come a day, I don't want it to happen, but there might come a day whenever they're, you know, too cool for school. Right. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Right. And I don't really want to say that, you know. When, you know, you take them to school for the first day, or, you know, maybe they're getting up in middle school or high school, and they want you to park six blocks down, and they want to walk because you're embarrassing to them as a parent. I want them to always love me. And I want, I want that going over and over their mind. I want to teach them how to love. I want to teach them how to love God, and I want to teach them how to Amen. love people. Because if they're going to get to heaven, they've got to learn how to do both. Amen. And we have to teach our children how to love God and how to love people. Yes. Don't teach them how to love God, but then if somebody upsets you or somebody hurts you, then you write them off and you don't have to deal with them anymore. Right. Teach them how to forgive right. when somebody wrongs them. Teach them that no matter what their struggle is, no matter what they go through, people may hurt them right. horribly. But teach them how to love. Right. Teach them how to love when they're hurt. And so they are a gift. And God specifically gives children to parents for the purpose of, of raising them and helping them. You know, if you have more than one child, uh, it's... You know, especially an older child, sometimes older children help raise their siblings a little bit. That happens. You know, big brother, big sister helps the other ones get ready. You're going to have that. But it is not the primary responsibility of the older sibling to raise the younger sibling. It's not at all. I mean, we're talking about marriage and family here. In a family unit, it takes all kinds, right? It does. But the primary responsibility falls on the shoulders of the parent. And the local church, we help with doctrinal teaching, with Christian teaching. We help put that into a child. To Listen, Jesus came to seek and save that which was lost. Right. That's his, that was His job. Yeah. Okay? That's what He wanted to do. That was His heart. And so the local church reaches out to the adults of the community. Yes, that's what we do. We're to seek and save that which is lost. But in our reaching, we don't need to forget that there's children that are lost too. Yeah. Right. That's why today, I'm excited we're baptizing three today. Yeah. We're baptizing three kids today. Yeah. And I'm as excited if I was, as if I was baptizing a 50-year-old person. I mean, I'm pumped today about this. Baptizing kids. I think it's awesome. You know, when a child comes and says, I want to be baptized, you know what that means? Yes, I know what it means. The blood of Jesus wash your sins away. Baptize those rascals in Jesus' name. That's, the, that's what we're supposed to do. So we reach them. We, 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 it's good when we have things for our kids next door and we do things over here for our children. It's so necessary. Because Jesus pulled them into Himself. He says, see these kids? This is the kingdom of heaven. You want to come to God? You come like a little child. Right. And if anybody harms one of these, it would be better than a millstone <coughs> hung about his neck and was cast in his hand. Protect these kids. Love these kids. And so, we love that. And, and uh, by the grace of God, I think we've got like two or three more to baptize uh, next week. Now, Brent's getting baptized next week, and I know his sister's going to get baptized next week, so... Very excited about that, and, and, and who knows what God's going to do there. So I'm extremely excited about, about this because we've got to work and labor together. It is not society's job to raise our kids. Amen. It is the church's job. Amen. Oh, Brother Roni, I take my kids to the YMCA every week. That's great. That's a good thing. Big brother, big sister, very positive, great environment. But they are not going to teach your children the things that they need to know. Amen. Oh, well, I get them involved in this, and I get them involved in they're in this group, and they're in that group. But I'm going to tell you something. They can go to all those things, be in all those things, but unless they know where their souls are going, 
when they die or God comes back, it's all wash. Every good thing. I want them to know that being baptized in Jesus' name is vitally important. That being filled with the gift of His Spirit, being filled with the gift of the Holy Ghost is important for every single child. We have to teach them what Jesus said. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness and everything else is going to be added unto you. But what about anything else? Seek the kingdom of God first. And we know that obviously the church cannot be responsible for all of the child's religious training. This is a problem with a lot of churches today. A lot of churches bring their kids to church, Brother Wallace. And they want the pastor and Sunday school teachers to teach them. But when they go home, they never talk about it. Right. Come on. They never talk about Jesus. They never teach love and forgiveness and giving. They don't do those. Listen, don't just wait. Pray at home. Read your Bible at home. Teach your kids. Put on music. Worship God at home. Amen. Amen. Get your offering and your tithing ready at home in front of your children. Teach them how to give. I'll never forget when we first started giving our kids offering to come to Sunday school class. We gave Colin two quarters. He came home with two quarters. <laughs> he did. He didn't you remember that. He didn't. He didn't. Uh, didn't give it. That was his money. He didn't want to give it. So we had to teach. You know, Connor was different. You give Connor two quarters. They could come home and he doesn't know where he put it in the plate or not. He could have <laughs> fell out. And it. Colin had it, man. He was saving that money. <laughs> but anyway, so we taught him to give it. And so now he wants to give it. And now when he when he does a little job and we give him a little money, he wants to give it. That's, that's never going to leave them. Teach them how to give. Teach them how to be a part of the kingdom of God and, and be blessed. There's enough, listen, there's enough stress out there in the world. Do you know that our society is dying because of stress? We are under a very stressful society and that stress destroys children. A very stressed, twisted, and perverted society destroys children through every ungodly means, every wile of the devil, and, and we will consider really only a handful today of the different weapons that the enemy uses. But, but there are biblical examples that reveal the evil deeds of societies that are destroying children in different ways. I want you to turn with me to the book of Exodus chapter 1 and verse 15. Please, Exodus chapter 1. We're going to read a few scriptures here. And I'm going to show you how in the Word of God that societies destroy children. And, and, and we're not very far off from what's happening actually in the world today. It happens in the world. Exodus chapter 1, verses uh, 15 and 16. When you look at this, uh, Egypt, in Egypt, the midwives were guilty of killing baby boys as they were born, as ordered by, by the Pharaoh. Uh, read for me, verses 15 and 16, Mother Wallace. And the king of Egypt spake to the Hebrew midwives, of which the name of one was Shiburah, and the name of the other, Ruah. And he said, Would you do of the office of a midwife to the Hebrew women, and see them upon the stools? If it be a son, then you shall kill him. If it be a daughter, then she shall live. All right. Pharaoh ordered, also ordered that the boy babies born were to be thrown in the river. Now, during the siege of Samaria, when, when um, they, uh, those who were in Samaria, when they were besieged, the Bible says that there were those that actually ate their own children to stay alive. They were starving to death, and so they ate their own children to stay alive. And when uh, Herod saw that he was mocked by the wise men, what did he do? He ordered that all children, two years old and younger, be killed. Now you might be saying, Pastor, that doesn't happen today. There's nobody eating kids today that we know of. There's nobody you know, throwing them into the river today. Well, let me share some things with you. When you look today, at the topic of child abuse and abortion. Amen. Child abuse and abortion, listen very carefully, have no place in a civilized society. Amen. None at all. Amen. And the church should we this should really this should really get us. If child abuse and abortion does not break your heart, then you do not have the love of God in your heart. Amen. Jeremiah said in Jeremiah chapter 5, verse 31, people love to have it so. 
Tolerance of evil is one of the greatest deterrents of revival in this day and age, and it will destroy the young. If you'll turn with me to 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse number 1. 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse number 1. This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. Perilous times shall come. For men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heavy, high-minded, lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God. Amen. According to Child Health uh, Magazine, every year, 3.3 million reports of child abuse are made in the United States involving nearly 6 million children. 6 million kids. Let that sink in for just a minute. Did you know that the United States, of every industrial nation, that the United States of America, among all of these nations, we have the worst record among all these nations, losing five children every single day to abuse-related deaths. Amen. Five kids a day in this country are dying because of child abuse. And we think this isn't relevant. We think that what we're discussing right here is that we brother we talk about they talk about giving me spiritual victory. Talk about, you know, healing my soul. Talk about how I can come in because I'm depressed and I'm hurting and I got this problem and I got that problem. Five children a day are killed because of abuse. That ought to stir us to prayer. That ought to stir us to fasting, to loving our kids. In December of 2012, there was a lot of Americans, Brother Jesse, that shed many tears. They flew their flags at half mast, and the nation officially mourned the killing of 20 young children at Sandy Hook Elementary School in Newtown, Connecticut. It was a very terrible tragedy, yes. very terrible tragedy, and uh, the responses that people had to that were appropriate responses, without a doubt. But I wonder, where are the tears for the mourning for more than one million babies that are aborted in the U.S. every year. Come on. Come on. I'm not saying that 20 kids getting killed because of gunfire is, is, is okay. That's terrible. But the same people that cry because of those kids are the same people that continue every year to push abortion in this country. Right. Right. It's still, it still hurts. Right. Right. And so, these are sobering things I'm talking about. Drugs and alcohol. There is such a double standard in this country. I love America, but we are full of double standards. Amen. It's appalling when you think about it. Though it's horrendous, only 20 uh, children were killed in, in, Sandy, in the Sandy Hook shooting. Uh -huh. There's many Americans that began to call out for, for gun control. But on the other hand, when you look at the double standard, look at the number of deaths that are directly related to drugs and alcohol, and it's very staggering and few people complain. Because they want their pleasure. They want what feels good to me. Oh, okay, so it's killing kids, but let's not do anything about it. Because it, it, it's a pastime for me. Clearly, society wants its drugs, wants its alcohol, despite all the destructive efforts on people. Further, in 2012, two U.S. states legalized marijuana for recreational use. Listen to me very carefully. When parents use drugs and alcohol in the presence of their children, you are teaching your children how to use drugs and alcohol. That's right. Amen. Listen, I know. I, I know. I went for my dad's class that looked like 7-Up. That was really Seagram's B.O. I went for that. And I, and my dad, I watched my dad as he watched me when I took a sip and it burned going all the way down. How he sat back and laughed and said, oh, I knew you'd like that. Yeah. And I was a child. I remember that. I remember that. That has never left me. That's still with me. When, when my boys went to school, uh, last year in school, they had a, a, a kid that would come to school and he would talk about how, how his dad drank daddy pop, is what he called it. Now, my dad won't let me have daddy pop because parents think, oh, it's, it's, it's okay for me, but not for you. Well, who are you kidding? Amen. Your kids are going to emulate your behavior. Yeah. Yeah. Your kids are going to mirror what you do. They're going to mirror everything, what you say, how you act. I know, I know this is not, you know, fun.
fuzzy kind of stuff. But folks, we have to hear this. As a church, we've got to learn how to do the right things and teach the right things and help other parents to teach their children the right way. Because that's what's important. We're living in a country, folks, where nothing is clean anymore. We're living in a world where nothing is clean anymore. According to Family Safe Media, the pornography industry worldwide is larger than the revenue of the top technology companies combined. The pornography industry in this world today is larger than Microsoft, Google, eBay, Yahoo, Apple, Netflix, Earthlink, bigger than all of them. United States pornography revenue exceeds the combined revenues of ABC, CBS, and NBC combined. Come on. The pornography revenue in this world today. The same group reports that 12% of total websites worldwide are pornographic. 12% worldwide. They also say that the average age of one's first internet exposure to pornography is 11 years old. I got kids. Listen to me. You have kids. Watch your media. Come on, somebody. Watch your media. When they get on the computer, when they get on the phone, there are people out there that are seeking to get their attention. And once a child sees it, once a child witnesses it, once it comes across their face, it's done. It's there. Right? Folks. We have to understand, oh, Brother Ronnie, none of that stuff happens in church. You have, listen, <laughs> don't think because you sat in the four walls of this church that this is a prison of amazing grace and you're protected. Because there's been many apostolic kids yes. that Amen. have fallen victim yes. to pornography. Yes. There's yes. many apostolic adults that have fallen victim to pornography. And I'm telling you, it's victimization. Yes. And they want to destroy our kids. They want to destroy our kids. Now, the possibility of exposure that we have and to all these things. Parents have to be protectors. Parents have to be providers. I know parents that let their kids just peruse on the internet. They don't even care what they watch. They don't know what they watch. They don't know the movies that they watch. Uh, anymore, you don't even have to get on the computer. And they let their kids watch whatever, listen to whatever, see whatever. There's things I just uh, learned here not long ago. There's some kind of an app out. I don't remember the name of it. There's an app out now that people can get on their phone. It's kind of like a Snapchat thing where you, if you take a picture, and they send it to somebody else, and then it disappears. They actually have an app now where you can send a text message to somebody that also has that app, and the moment you send it and they read it, then it disappears. It's gone. It's deleted. There's no accountability. Teenagers today can say what they want, send pictures however they want, doesn't matter. Folks, where's the church? I'll tell you where the church is. The church is right here teaching our young people that right is still right, wrong is still wrong. I'm going to protect their innocence as long as I possibly can. I'm not going to give in to secularism and new age and all this stuff. You know, listen, the Eastern way of thinking, the Eastern religions, a lot of those are coming over to the West and it's trying to change everybody's mind. And now you've got kids in school that are in elementary school that don't even, they, they believe God is, is just non-existent. They're, they're children proclaiming to be atheists. They're children proclaiming to be agnostic. Children talking about, you know, everything but God. And so, in fact, when you uh, define secularism, it's a spirit or tendency, especially a system of political or social philosophy that, watch this, rejects all forms of religious faith and worship. You know what the world wants? The world wants your kids to believe in absolutely nothing. Amen. The world wants your kids to believe in absolutely nothing. And secularism is the evil twin of humanism. It is. And so, a system of values and beliefs that oppose, uh, that are opposed to the values and beliefs of traditional religions. New age means of or pertaining to a movement espousing a broad range of philosophies and practices traditionally viewed as an occult, metaphysical, or paranormal. There are kids in school today that are just freaky weird kids. They come to school 
and they get all blacked out. You know what I mean? Yeah. I don't know why that kid is so weird. Oh, you know, all he wants to listen. Twilight brought in a whole rush. It wasn't the only thing. I mean, vampire stuff's been around for a long time, folks. I mean, let's let's just let's just be real about it. Okay, but but it's it's, it's interesting to me how progressively those things become more Disney. Right. Back in the day, man, Dracula was he was a bad dude. Right. Yeah. He wasn't cool with a six pack. He might have had a beard gut, who knew? No beard. <laughs> One thing's for sure, he definitely was not, I mean, he wasn't, but man, they made vampires and werewolves and yeah, they made it so cool and hip and stylish. That's what they wanted. Right. I don't believe in vampires. I don't believe in werewolves. I believe in wolves. I believe in vampire bats. I don't believe in that. Oh, it's only make believe. It's only Hollywood. Do you know how bad that destroys kids? Right. Oh, yeah. Well, they don't watch it much. They just need to see it one time. Right. They just need to be afraid. Right. They just need to be introduced to darkness one time. And then if something doesn't intervene, that's where you have to get your kids in the church. And that's why you have to get your children to an altar. And that's why you have to get your children in love with Jesus. And that's why you have to teach your kids how to worship the Lord. And then all that darkness, all that, you know, here's what we have to understand. The darkness is bragging today. Darkness wants to promote itself as the greatest power in the world today. But darkness cannot ever exist without the light ruling it, ever. Amen. Darkness is worthless on its own. It has no. The Bible says that whenever God, uh, whenever everything was just complete darkness and, and darkness was over the face of the deep, the Bible said that the Lord created two lights. One would rule the day, but the lesser light, even the lesser light, would rule the night. Darkness will always have a ruler. Yes. Even the, come on somebody, even the lesser light. I'm going to teach my kids, they don't need to be afraid of the dark. Because there's nothing in the dark that can hurt them as long as even the lesser life is present. As long as there is Jesus Christ. Let me tell you something. Your kid may be backslid and may be one step away from ending it all. But just that lesser life, if they'll remember. You know, my mom and dad taught me that no matter what I did, no matter how far down I got, my mom and dad taught me that all I had to do was call on the name of Jesus and everything was going to be all right. We have got the power and the ability by the Holy Ghost and by the anointing of God to save our children. Amen. Teach them the right things. Right. Say no to drugs and alcohol. Say no to pornography and fornication and the things that the world has packaged up. Oh, my kids, they don't have anything to do with that. Great, that's fantastic. But you know what else destroys kids? Materialism. Right. Amen. Right. When it is so important for you to have everything and your kids have it, you are not going to hurt little Johnny's feelings or little Sarah's, sorry, little Tanya's feelings. <laughs> it just comes out. By saying, no, you cannot have that toy. Do you know how many parents won't tell their kids no because they're terrified that they're going to grow up with some kind of a personality disorder? Let me, let me share a little fact with you. If you don't tell your kids no enough, they will grow up with personality disorders. And here's the biggest one. They think everything is owed to them. My mom told me, never told me no. My dad never told me no. Why are you telling me no? Because we're doing what your mom and dad should have done. Right. Amen. Should, they should tell you no every once in a while. They don't have to have every toy in Walmart. Right. Every time my kids go to Walmart, they think they get a prize. We tell them, you don't get a prize every time you go to Walmart. You have to do some good things to get a prize. Right? Amen. Like clean the house. <laughs> Let's just start with your room. Let's just clean it out. Here's what materialism is. Materialism is a preoccupation with or emphasis on material objects, comforts, and considerations with disinterest or rejection of spiritual, intellectual, or cultural values. Here's what this means. Everybody ready? When you put things above God, your children notice. Amen. Amen. When you, well, that's not important. This is important. Let me tell you something. And I, you all know me. You know me. You know that I'm not, I'm not up here, you know, browbeating everybody. But I'm going to tell you something. 
When you put more time into materialistic things, when you put more time into things like sports, things, whatever, you name it, then you do come to church in the kingdom of God, your kids pick up on that. Yeah. Amen. And they know it. And skip in church, they don't right. Because it's materialism. Materialism involves placing emphasis on everything except for God. Here's what materialism does. It minimizes, if not excludes God from the lives of children. Suddenly, everything else is more important. And so, children are greatly affected by this. In James chapter 3 and verse 11, listen to this. James chapter 3 and verse 11, turn there with me if you would. Very interesting scripture. I've got to read this, so hang on with me for just a few more minutes. James chapter 3 and verse 11. Doth a fountain send forth at the same place sweet water and vinegar? <laughs> Can the fig tree, my brethren, bear olive berries, either a vine, figs? So can no fountain both yield salt water and fresh. Amen. You know what that means? That means you need whatever you say that you are, that's what you need to be. Don't be a hypocrite. Don't say you've got fresh water coming out your mouth and then salt water coming out your mouth. Right. right? Amen. Okay. Parents need to do everything they can to provide a very normal environment. For, you know what we have today? We have dysfunctional families. Let's be honest today. How many have thought at one point or another that you have a dysfunctional family? Yeah. I'll be the first one raising it. <laughs> oh, brother. Come on. I, you know, here's the deal. Everybody thinks that. Okay? What it means to be dysfunctional is something that is completely the opposite of normal. There's not a lot of you know, you have to, how do we gauge normal today, right? But I'm going to tell you something. There are dysfunctional families that are all over the place that are not tending to their children. There's predators out there that are out to attack their children. And they want to break them down. They want to destroy them. There are children that their parents don't care. Their families don't care. They need academic help in school because they just absolutely do not, their parents do not care about their education. Right. Parents are under a lot of pressure. And we have to provide for our kids. First Timothy 5 and 8 says, but if any provide not for his own, and especially for those of his own house, he hath denied the faith and is worse than an infidel. So we got to prepare. We've got to prepare our children. Protect them and provide for them. One pastor told of a, uh, a dysfunctional family, true story, as I get ready to close in just a moment, one pastor told of a very dysfunctional family in a certain city. The local pastor knocked on the door one Saturday and invited the, the children to Sunday school. There was a 16-year-old boy there with long hair, and he was rocking out on the guitar. Man, he had his shirt off, and he was just strumming a rock tune. The following Sunday, that young man was in church. He started attending faithfully and telling the pastor how he was abused, listen, by his stepdad. The stepdad would beat him and his brothers and his sisters with a two-by-four. The dad would actually hide the toilet tissue from them saying that they used too much. But that Sunday, this one son repented of his sins, was baptized in Jesus' name, and received the gift of the Holy Ghost. The pastor related how this young man, true story, was the most dedicated young person he had ever pastored. He grew up, married, and is still in the church. His son went to the Bible school and became a missionary for the United Pentecostal Church in the What would have happened if nobody would have invited the dysfunctional kids to come to church? You know what we have? We have young people here today. We have kids here today that they may not come from a home or may not come from a place where it, you know everything is, is cool and everything is... Um, but I'm going to tell you something. It's the long hair, rocking out, my dad beats me kid that will come to church and get baptized and get the Holy Ghost and be a minister for the gospel of Jesus Christ. So let's continue to work and labor together for the Lord and ask God to do great things for us. I believe the Holy Ghost is here. God's going to minister in this service. Great things to come. Won't you stand with me right now? Let's lift our hands to heaven. Amen. Let's just praise Him for a